love my dog, and she loves to play outside. When we're in the yard or taking walks, she poops. <laughs> no, not in the toilet. On the grass. That's what dogs do. But we remember to pick it up so the yucky germs stay out of the water. When it rains, water flows right back to our rivers and streams. Picking up after your pet helps keep our water clean. Learn more at wheredoesitgo.org slash pup. Dogs can't flush. Remember to pup. The Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District presents Clean Water Works, a monthly news magazine and your source for local water, sewer, and stormwater news that affects you and your community. Clean Water Works features the people, projects, and programs that are protecting your health and environment. Your Sewer District, keeping our Great Lake great. Hi and welcome to Clean Water Works, a monthly news magazine brought to you by the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. I'm Jen Elting. I'm a Senior Public Information Specialist at the Regional Sewer District. I've been there just about 10 years and it is never a dull day at the district. And I'm Raymond Whedon. I'm a retiree from the Sewer District. I worked 35 years and I'm just happy to be back to help with this show. And we're here high atop the uh, Huntington Cleveland Convention Center and welcome to this edition of Clean Water Works. In this episode of Clean Water Works, we're going to learn more about our regional stormwater management program and our popular PUP program. But first, let's hear from Frank Greenland at Sewer U. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sewer U, Sewer University. We're going to talk today about the history of sewers and clean water in Northeast Ohio, specifically the greater Cleveland area. I am Frank Greenland. I'm the director of watershed programs. This presentation is available on our website at narsd.org slash seweru. Now I'm gonna spend some time on sewer systems and I wanna talk about how sewer systems evolved, the different types, the different problems, some of the strategies to remediate those problems. And this was sewage treatment back in the day, way, way back. There were no sewers locally. So people were collecting their waste in buckets and barrels and dumping their waste in the front yard, in the backyard, wherever. That was sewage treatment back in the day. And obviously that's a major public health threat. Outhouses were really hot back in the 1800s. And in some areas there's still a few outhouses. But outhouses, I guess, consolidated the waste, but was not a long-term solution and you use an outhouse and it fills and now you got to do something else. So this was definitely not a permanent solution. During the 1800, because the city was growing, they felt you can't dump this waste on the street. That's a health threat. We've got to deal with issues of street flooding and waste on the streets. So they, we started to, they started to build combined sewers at that point. So the earliest sewers are 1800s. And really they were designed more for street flooding than anything else. Mr. Crapper had an ingenious invention back in the 1800s of, you know, using water to flush toilets and flush that waste stream away from you. Now you're using water, you're not using a bucket, so obviously the flow of wastewater, the volume of wastewater is increased, and now you have the ability to get, out, get it out of your house fast, but it's got to go somewhere. So what happened was because of the growing community and the growing waste stream, we started to connect house sewers or industrial sewers to these combined sewers and that's why we call them combined. We're co combining two flows. One is a stormwater flow off the street, the other is a wastewater flow, sewage coming out of your house or coming out of industry. And combined sewers were the oldest sewers in the nation. It was a matter of choice. This is Mr. Herring back in 1882, public official for the city of Cleveland who recognized that the filth of the street <laughs> alone, the filth on the street and the filth from human waste was significant enough that we shouldn't separate these waste streams, we should combine them and get them the heck away from people. So the combined sewer system was actually a matter of choice to deal with contaminated stormwater and sewage at the same time. So this region started to grow and we started to construct what, those interceptor sewers I talked about, late 1800s, into about 1939, 1940, combined interceptors started to stretch out across the region and we started to collect more waste 
from homes and industry, but we didn't take those, that waste to treatment plants. Those waste streams were consolidated at three points, and those three points are shown on the graphic to the right. Those were the first interceptors. They're combined interceptors. They took stormwater runoff, they took waste, but they consolidated that waste stream and dropped that waste into the Cuyahoga River in the center where Southerly is, and to Lake Erie at the westerly and easterly locations. So no wastewater treatment. This is like take the waste, send it to the water body, because at that time, dilution is the solution to pollution, or so they thought. So again, the interceptor sewers of the highways, it expressed that waste to the water bodies. Way back, they thought this has got to be better than dumping human waste on the street. And actually it was. I got to think it was, because human waste on the street is, can't be good from a health perspective. And they felt the water bodies can certainly absorb this, but we've learned over time that is not the case. That is not the case. And so what happened was back in the 20s and early 30s, the three treatment plants, those interceptors ended up at the location where our three treatment plants now exist, easterly, westerly, and southerly. And the first treatment plants, some very rudimentary, were built. And actually, I think we led in the nation in terms of starting to construct treatment plants at a very early period of time. Now I'm going to deal with the progression of how sewer systems evolved locally. Combined sewer system, the way it operates today, is you're collecting stormwater runoff and sanitary sewage, homes and industry, in one pipe. In dry weather, there's no problem. The flows are very low. But when it rains, those combined sewers fill because of primarily rooftop and, and street runoff. Devices were built in the system. We call them regulator structures. They're little weirs, little dams in the sewer that allow a lot of the flow to continue to go to our treatment plant. But these devices were sized to allow some of the excess flow to spill over the top of the weir. And that was primarily done to prevent basement flooding or street flooding. Uh, and when that flow goes over, it's not going to the treatment plant anymore. It's going directly to the environment, either directly to Lake Erie or any of the area streams in our area. And that's what a combined sewer overflow is. This really kind of shows you how this system works. We've got a side spill weir. It's a dam to the left, the overflow pipe, a relief pipe to the right. In dry weather, the flows are low. You're actually looking into a combined sewer, and most of our combined sewers are old egg-shaped brick sewers, which is kind of neat. Low flow in dry weather, everything's going to the treatment plant. It starts to rain, the flows from the street, from stormwater runoff get up, and those flows start to rise in that pipe until they hit what we call an SWO, a stormwater outlet. So once it hits that top elevation, it will spill over. That excess flow is what we call combined sewer overflow. And because we're talking sewage and stormwater, there are pollutants in that discharge, and they do impact water quality. A little different arrangement, perpendicular weirs or leaping weirs. Leaping weirs are kind of interesting because what you're seeing is a combined sewer coming in. At the bottom, that little cut where you see some water, that's the sanitary sewer below. The sanitary sewage will drop into that pipe. When it rains, it leaps that square. And that flow that continues downstream goes to the environment. We've got a question here. Frank, do you have some way of quantifying the amount of uh, overflow? We estimate when the sewer district was created, over 9 billion gallons of combined sewer overflow discharged annually to the area waterways. We've cut it in half. In fact, I think we're about to make another incremental leap down. Today, about four and a half, a little less than four and a half billion gallons of overflow go out of the environment. The $3 billion CSO control plan, combined sewer overflow control plan, will dramatically reduce that. I don't think combined sewers are that bad, personally. When you look at the urban environment, look at the stuff on the streets. Oils, greases, junk, litter. The urban environment's got a lot of pollutants in terms of stormwater, so combined sewers I don't think are a problem. The overflows are problematic, and you need to tackle that. That's Sewer University. Twenty nineteen will mark fifty years of progress since the most famous of fires on the Cuyahoga River. 
On June 22, 1969, a spark set ablaze a blackened coat of oily pollution floating on the Cuyahoga. It was not the first fire. The Cuyahoga had blazed more than a dozen times prior, but this time the response was different and it changed the country's future. In the late 1960s, Cleveland's industrial prosperity had resulted in environmental neglect. Not enough was done to adequately treat wastewater in our booming industrial city, and there were no industrial discharge regulations. The 1969 fire thrust Cleveland into the national spotlight. Cleveland Mayor Carl Stokes, a longtime advocate for environmental responsibility, criticized the federal government and vowed to fight for a cleaner river. Time magazine detailed Stokes's fury in an article about the river's burning. In 1970, a groundbreaking piece of environmental legislation, the National Environmental Policy Act, helped to establish the Environmental Protection Agency. In 1972, Congress passed the Federal Water Pollution Control Amendments, which would become the Clean Water Act of 1977. It was in this national context that the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District was created. The district took responsibility for the wastewater treatment needs of Greater Cleveland, including clamping down on industrial discharges into the lake and river. Once declared dead by national media, the Cuyahoga River now boasts more than 60 different species of fish and has been found to be a home of freshwater mussels. Today we're going to visit with our sewer system maintenance and operation team and they're going to show us how they keep the sewer system running clean and smooth. The Sewer System Maintenance and Operation Department, also known as SSMO, clears out blockages that keep the Sewer District's collection system from operating at full capacity and efficiency. The JetVac is a large truck that SSMO uses to keep the sewers clean. It has jet and vacuum systems and storage tanks for flushing out and removing debris. SSMO crews use iPads to access geographic information system data that displays all of the sewer district's collection system assets. Blueprints, drawings, any notes that have been added to a particular line. So if you're out in the field and you're having a problem with something, you're going to be able to access some pretty valuable material. It helps you kind of quickly determine whose line is which and where our responsibility is here or where we need to be looking for a problem and kind of troubleshooting that, you know, back up the line or, or downstream to find out where a block is.
this camp was going to be about how like to drink water, how to use it for dishes and stuff. I didn't think you'd learn about how to clean water. But then when I came to the camp, I learned that what we do to the water really affects how the ecosystem reacts to it and responds off of it. So I learned to take care of water more. Tell me, what was your favorite part about camp? My favorite part about camp was learning how to use water properly. I liked the experiments we did and all the fun activities. When you're out walking your dog, you want to be a responsible pet owner. And part of being responsible is picking up after your pets. Learn more about our pup program and how you can get involved. Did you know that dog droppings can impact our groundwater, streams, and lake? When it rains, bacteria from doggy dew can soak into the groundwater or be carried by the rain into storm sewers, which go to nearby streams. That's not good for the environment. There were more than 90,000 dogs in Cuyahoga County. If each dog poops twice a day, that's more than 45 tons of doggy droppings every day. Due to dogs' high-protein diets, their waste is highly acidic. It is not a fertilizer, and it can contain 10 times as much bacteria as cow manure and a whole lot of nasty stuff like E. coli and salmonella. Cleaning up after your dog is a simple step you can take to help keep your local waterways clean and free of harmful bacteria. We encourage you to take our pup pledge to bag your pet waste and dispose of it in the trash. Plus, it's the polite thing to do for your neighbors. Visit dogscantflush.org for more information. In this next segment, we're going to be joined by Rachel Webb, and she's going to tell us about the district's regional stormwater management program and some things you can do at home on your property to save on your stormwater management fee. Here in the city of Cleveland, residents receive a monthly bill from the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. That bill includes fees for wastewater treatment service and a monthly maintenance fee. But there's also another line on there that you might see, and it's called a stormwater fee. And I'm here today with Rachel Webb, who's our senior watershed team leader for the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, to talk a little bit about the stormwater fee, what it's for, and this big thing right here in front of me. So welcome to the show, Rachel. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here to talk about this, but first I want to talk about the fee. That's what everybody's usually the most interested in. Yes, absolutely. So the stormwater fee, it's based on the impervious area on your property. So that is the roof, that is the driveway, that is your detached garage, your patio, your deck, all of that. We calculate the impervious surface, that hard surface, and based on that, we come up with the fee. For the average homeowner, about three, 4,000 square feet, it is 515 a month. For less than that, less than 3,000 uh, square feet is $3.03. So that's a monthly fee that you see on the bill. And what is that fee, um, what are those monies used for? So that money is used for the Regional Stormwater Management Program, and that is going towards our large streams in our service area that have flooding, erosion, water quality issues, all of those three items. So there's construction projects, there's mm -hmm. planning, there's stream bank stabilization. We have projects throughout our service area and Cleveland mm -hmm. uh, that we are constructing to reduce those issues around our area. So what are some of the streams in the Cleveland area that our viewers might be familiar with? So that would include the Cuyahoga River, which is the big one, obviously. You have Euclid Creek, you have Dome Brook, you have Dugway, and you have Big Creek. So all ones very visible th areas that we see every day with these issues. So what are some of the issues that you see in the streams? Um, are there debris issues as well? Can you tell me a little bit about those? Oh, I love to talk to debris. Debris is uh, it's one of our... Uh, primary activities that we do every day out in the field. We look at, we see the debris, it is blocking a culvert, mm -hmm. uh, a crossing that goes underneath the road. The debris backs up behind it, it collects, and it needs to be removed so it doesn't cause a flooding problem. So we work with our stormwater inspection and maintenance team. They go out, they investigate, inspect, 
make recommendations, mm -hmm. and then we have contractors that go out and remove that debris before it becomes a flooding issue. So it's definitely helpful for Cleveland residents. Oh, most definitely. So with the fee, um, I understand that there are some ways that residents can get credits and not have to pay quite as large of a fee each month. So could you tell me about some of the most popular opportunities? Yes, yeah, so we love to give a credit for folks that are doing stormwater management mm -hmm. on their property. Residents in particular, that's what this is here today. This is a rain barrel. This is a very popular way to get a credit. Uh, it actually serves dual purposes. It's excellent if you're a gardener, so you take the advantage that come with having rain barrel on your property for the garden, watering your vegetables, watering your landscape, but it can also get you that storm water credit that you were talking about. So, so could you tell me a little bit about how this big rain barrel works? So this barrel here collects uh, runoff from your roof. It does okay. that. You have a diverter. Uh, that connects to your downspout, you connect that, and then that diverter has a tube on it, so the water comes down your gutter, or on your gutter, down your downspout, it's diverted into the rain barrel through a tube off of that uh, diverter that you have. You connect it into the rain barrel, it fills up when it rains, mm -hmm. so then you have that water stored in here so you can use it for your garden, uh, your landscaping, and then uh, in front of us there is a spigot at the bottom that basically it's a simple spigot, you open it up and water is there. Uh, what I like to do is I hook up my hose to mm -hmm. the spigot. So I like to keep the barrel lifted up. So it's very, to use it for landscaping, you want some water pressure to help okay. move that water out of the barrel when you need it. So you lift it up a couple of inches off the ground with some bricks or something like that. And then you connect the hose and then you can take the hose where you need to around the yard. It is not like your normal spigot with a lot of water pressure, mm -hmm. but it does a great job. And it doesn't have chlorine, which is really good for your plants. And it's at air temperature, which is even better because plants don't like to be shocked by that cold water that comes out of the hose. And so how much water can fit in this rain barrel? This is 50 gallons about. Uh, this is your standard size rain barrel. Uh, there are places all across the county, both Cuyahoga and Summit mm -hmm. County, uh, specifically Soil and Water Conservation okay. District, where they can help you make your rain barrel uh, and give you information on how to install it. Unfortunately, they don't paint it for you. So that <laughs> falls to you as your homeowner to decorate mm -hmm. it any way you like. You can see we have a beautifully decorated one here, um, but there are different ways that you can, usually they're just blue. Okay but we recommend painting them. It's a great kids project. It does sound like a wonderful kids project. So um, with a rain barrel, how much of a credit can a homeowner receive on their sewer bill? Great question. So it's a 25% credit for the residential credit that, you ha that you'll that you get. You do need to make sure that you drain 50% of your roof area with a rain barrel. So a lot of times that does require having more than one rain right. barrel. And we can help you uh, figure that out or provide you with some information to help calculate that so you know uh, before you submit your application where you are if you may need another rain barrel to get the credit. And are these rain barrels expensive, provided it's a non-painted custom one? So there are different ways to get a rain barrel. You can always go online. Those tend to be a little more expensive. Cuyahoga Soil and Water Conservation District does workshops in the summer, throughout the summer. I believe there's a couple more in September still. Their fee is $60, mm -hmm. and that gets you a rain barrel, and they help you construct it. So when you leave the workshop, you have something that looks like this, but blue, obviously. And then you can also, uh, they have a pamphlet. So on Water Conservation District actually has a pamphlet that provides all the information on how you can make your own. So if you're handy and you have the tools, you can do it on your own. Mm -hmm. It costs maybe about the same mm -hmm. amount, maybe a little less, maybe about $50 to get all of it together. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Rachel, and helping all of our viewers learn more about rain barrels. It was definitely um, informational and educational, and I really appreciate you being here today. No problem. Thank you for the time. And as I said, all, give us a call, and we can help with any questions that customers may have. Perfect. Great. And we look forward to hopefully seeing somebody out at one of the upcoming rain barrel workshops. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this month's edition of Clean Waterworks. I'm Jen Elting. And I'm Ray Whedon. See you again next month. The mission of the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District is to provide progressive management of sewage and stormwater through fiscal responsibility, innovation, and community partnerships. Our vision is to be the environmental leader in enhancing quality of life in the region and protecting its water resources. Thank you.